we're going to continue with the conference. Is it okay? Did we start? Yes. Uh, so this second part, we're going to listen and understand how in, pra in practicalities, uh, people and um, just the ICT ecosystem works and how from different sectors, different perspectives, we are able to understand uh, what are they doing? What are they doing with this aspect of gender equality? And maybe moving, how Daniela mentioned, moving towards a healthier gender equality uh, approach yeah, to the work environment. Uh, so first, thank you, the three of you, for being here on the present you. So we have uh, Moa Pezote, she's representing Vinova, the Swedish agency. So she's so she's representing uh, the public sector for today, and she's going to mention how does it, uh, we're going to get to see, uh, understand her insights, how does it look like from the public sector. So welcome, Moa. Then we have Natalia. Uh, Natalia Farfan Santos, she is the head of di DEI, or Diversity, Equity, and, and, and Integration at Ericsson. So she is also going to speak how a, a multinational is working on these issues within their own organization. And then we have Ellen. So Ellen, she is from Abshack. So she is um, an amazing computer scientist. <laughs> and she is working with app development and web development from, for a startup, that, uh, an established startup growing. Uh, so we um, are going to hear her perspective, how, we, how our companies within the organizations as well, they're adopting these new policies and just updating their work as we evolve and want to advance uh, gender equality. So wel welcome, the three of you. Uh, so the way that we're going to be doing it, I'm going to open a general question, and then I'm going to go uh, per you as a how in the sector it looks like. So first for you, Moa. So we're going to uh, just have like um, just a overview of how this ICT uh, looks like in your industry. Like what's, what is your assessment of the status of ICT uh, in Sweden for this specific field? Sure. So thank you for, for having me and for the question. Um, so Vinova, the Swedish Innovation Agency, uh, we do finance, research, and innovation with Swedish tax money. Um, and when talking about women in this field, we know that there's an underrepresentation of women. Um, so I mean, the status of women in this field is that they're underrepresented and underserved, uh, but they are highly wanted. Uh, meaning that we need to focus more on how to integrate them in the projects that we do finance, uh, but we also need to focus on strategic programs focusing on um, making women more interested in working in this field, but also, as been said before uh, during the previous presentation, making sure that uh, workplaces, uh, big organizations, and the public sectors uh, make sure to become role models, not putting that on the individual women but uh, actually making it more relevant for women working in these um, these uh, kind of uh, jobs. So, I mean, it is more of the same, right? Uh, we do know that women in the ICT industry are underrepresented. Uh, I think whatever you see and whichever type of organization, big as Ericsson with 100,000 employees or smaller ones, um, the percentage of women doesn't go beyond 30%. And reaching 30%, actually, it's like a huge success for many of these organizations. Uh, we do know also here in Sweden, I think that uh, on the latest Albright uh, report, um, was mentioned that women in leadership positions, in not only in the ICT industry, but in general, it is around 28%. So we do know, again, that that's the status. Um, for Ericsson, we have 21% of our uh, leaders being women and 25%, 21% of managers and 25% of um, our total population being women. Uh, we operate in 180 countries, so um, we see that they actually the challenge is very similar, regardless of the local reality. Of course, in Sweden, it's much better. Um, but unfortunately, that's, the, that's how it looks like. So, yeah. I, I see. I see the same thing as you say, uh, said before, and I think what I can stress uh, like more is also that what we see. I mean, we have an underrepresentation overall when it comes to developers, 
So, I mean, for businesses as well, there's like sort of a business value mm -hmm. in like, attracting more talent into the field. Like, so that is what I can add on to that. But we also see the underrepresentation, and I mean, I have the perk of working in a lot of different uh, like IT teams since I'm a consultant. Um, and what I also can say is like the diverse teams work so much better. I mean, you can see the feeling of what you can are able to produce uh, is so much better when you have more a uh, diverse team than just one-minded, sort of. So, um, in maybe 90% of the funding that we know do, we finance consortium, meaning that we want actors from academia, startups, big industries, public sectors come together uh, in an innovation project. So um, one responsibility we do have is to mobilize these actors, making sure that we have different kinds of actors working together on specific um, challenges that we have in the society because we, uh, we need to finance sustainable uh, innovations or um, in innovations that can help us uh, solve these big um, yeah, worldwide challenges that we do have. Um, and to do that, we need to have diverse actors coming together. Um, so one way we can do is to mobilize actors. Mm, I mean, uh, kind of actors in this room, uh, working with what, what you're doing in this sector. Um, meaning that we need to frame the specific calls that we have in a way that it um, makes sense for, for diverse actors to apply for the funding. Um, but it's also a challenge for us because we are um, a governmental agency, so we are um, whatever kind of political decisions we get. So if these decisions are being focused on specific um, fields, uh, they can be more or less uh, men dominated. Because as you said before, the, the STEM industry is, uh, is a wide industry. Uh, maybe we need to break it down a bit more to understand where we have uh, different kind of challenges. But in general, the STEM field is very uh, male dominated. So we need also to um, to make sure that the, um, uh, the polit political decisions and tasks that we get are, are framed in a way that it makes sense for a diverse, diverse uh, range of actors to apply for the funding. Um, but in some programs, we finance just individual startups. Um, so we are making sure that we communicate this mm -hmm. offer uh, towards startups that are not just um, in a male-dominated sector, but also run by women mm. and diverse founders. And in our assessment criteria, we always have uh, gender equality in terms of representation in the project team as an assessment criteria. But we also do have it as a criteria when it comes in terms of integrating those perspectives in the in the innovation, in the research mm. content, mm. Um, because otherwise there's uh, there's a risk of us uh, promoting solutions that uh, do not take specific perspective into uh, into consideration when um, sort of develop the solutions. In in um, in tech solution, that's I mean that's very crucial. You can take AI yeah. as an example. If you have biased data, or if you don't take uh, a, a diverse group of, um, of stakeholders into mind, you will scale inequality instead of solving, solving yes. it. Yes. You know, we have one of our, our members, she's like a gender expert, but in budgeting, just budgeting. So that's her, she's like, talk about uh, with me anything that is gender budgeting. So uh, one key thing that she always uh, talks about is that why do we keep on, on talking on topic of a uh, gender equality as like something separate like it's it should always be incorporated okay uh, tech solutions how is it affecting gender like always it should always be in parallel instead of s having like an extra but rather being incorporated in the decisions and yes and like the way that you are funding organizations um, so you mentioned um, how it's a challenge to find this companies that uh, have that uh, agenda incorporated within their organizations. Um, so for you, is limi so you mentioned that Vinova is limited, that they are able to, um, how do you say, like nudge or have influence on that. But 
what do you think are what have you seen that are the biggest challenges that you see um, that there's no increase of representation as well to those that are uh, seeking for funding? I mean, the the challenge for us is. Um, I mean, we have a very segregated labor market mm -hmm. in Sweden. Um, so the challenge is that if we get, um, as I said before, if we if we have very steered money in tor uh, towards a specific industry, that's a challenge for us, depending on how that uh, market looks like, uh, representation-wise. Mm -hmm. But it's up to us also to make sure that we, as I said before, frame the programs and the calls, that it makes sense, that we uh, raise awareness mm -hmm. of I said before, if you have diverse project teams, um, you get better solutions. So maybe there's um, there's hard to to get a, a project uh, member uh, in a specific call uh, because there's a lack of, of knowledge in that field or representation mm -hmm. in that field. But you can ask them to to find um, test panels or uh, steering committees that are more represented. Mm -hmm. So you can always work with inclusion in, in various kinds of ways. Uh, mm. it's, it's, a, it's a bit of creativity and a an, an normal cri uh, critical approach, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, th I think it's important that we put um, the light on who should, like who's the role model. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it the individuals in the field doing their job or should it be other actors, mm. such as Vinova, for mm -hmm. example? Um, I, I think we need to, to be be better in being role models ourselves than putting it on the on the women in the field. Absolutely, yes. And uh, speaking on um, setting up the stage of like the standards, um, for Ericsson or for you, Natalia, what you've seen, um, how? Because we mentioned from the previous uh, research how sometimes that uh, there's a more external pressure and more external. Um, interest or to have like a better image outside rather than uh, like make it a priority within the organization however it's not that common or it's kind of like a privilege once a company becomes bigger to actually have a whole department dedicated to DEI topics and how like working in a multinational and um, how does that look like in terms of uh, incorporating the policies uh, maybe through HR but also the trainings like maybe you can give us as that perspective of how it's already incorporated in the everyday uh, work or company culture um, I see two things in that question I think the first one is uh, the, that external pressure perspective mm. uh, I think it's to fold it because on one side mm. you can fall into that to what you were saying on the non-healthy kind of perspective, mm. which is only about like how we look like. Mm. But I think the positive side of that is when external pressure comes, things happen. Mm. Especially, and I see it like in the last five years, even more, um, even your investors on big organizations in Sweden really putting that as a topic, as a non-negotiable for you to move forward. So I think that's the positive side of it. Then when it comes on how incorporating the DNI word, let's say, into a big organization, as I was saying, we are 101,000 employees operating in 180 countries. So you have to really have the, the basics right. Um, I always start that saying that when it comes to DNI, very often we also uh, focus only on the employee side of it, which is very important and it is core. Uh, but it is good to see like four kind of like boxes for us to act there as an organization. One piece is the employee side, how we increase representation and inclusion in that in that box, let's say. The other perspective is how do you include in inclusion into what you do? Mm. So the products that you develop, how, because it has been demonstrated based on research, how more diverse teams also generate more innovative mm. uh, products and services. So how do you include that inclusion perspective there? The third one is how do you work with your suppliers and what mm. do you ask them to act on, for example, gender equality standards? And then what do you offer also to your clients? So those are the, f the, f the initial thing, right? Then when it comes to like internally as in a big organization, Last week I was talking with uh, a group of women of a startup here in, in Sweden and they were like 
where do we start? So uh, it forced me to actually simplify it um, in the shape of a house. So I always say that the very first step is to make sure that the foundation is right. And most of the times the foundation of an organization are the values and the code of business ethics, because are those are the rules of the house. Mm -hmm. Like if you state there that there is no space for discrimination, harassment, and that you always aim to make fair decisions, that's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not the end game, but it is a good start game. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the foundation. Then the house has two um, strong pillars on the sides, and it is uh, where are you and where do you want to get? So where are you, what are your numbers? how the organization looks like as of today. And as we were saying, what is the inclusion of men, for example, but non-binary and all the other different perspectives. And where do you want to get? What are the goals? And how you incorporate those goals as part of the business system? I have seen that definitely when the targets of the organization and DNI in general is allocated as, as or treated in the same way as an mm -hmm. any other business decision, then you actually see change. Because from the top management, that's you know something that you follow. Then the third pillar is the different initiatives that we have. And what do you offer? So yes, we know where we are. We, we know where we want to get. Uh, but what do you offer for that to happen? So those initiatives, I try to always put into three different windows, let's say. So the first one are the processes. So employee life cycle, since the moment that someone joins the organization till the moment that person leaves, especially women, what are the biases that are there? Mm -hmm. We as human beings are biased. It is part of our human condition. Mm -hmm. We are never going to be the biased, mm -hmm. but we can debias the processes. Mm -hmm. The second thing is like, if the processes in the way that we hire promote and assign, for example, salary is, you know, overviewed, um, what, are, how, what is the support that we give to women? So things as, for example, sponsorship, and I say sponsorship more than mentoring, mm -hmm. because we very often mentor women, but do not sponsor them. We sponsor mm -hmm. more men than mm -hmm. we actually sponsor women. And the third thing is educating uh, our people leaders, which very often, as we were saying, men so how do we incorporate inclusive leadership perspectives there for that to happen and finally the roof which is the follow-up and the governance behind all of this with the intersectionality lens like we were saying what is the status of women in the organization I was saying 28% of the management positions in Sweden are women uh, when it comes to women of color that's 0 0.5 mm. so very important to also yeah. always have that intersectionality lens Mm. Absolutely, and and as a very very good point, how you're saying it's, uh, for example, I'm thinking back of what we've been doing uh, <coughs> with this project, and then this critical approach that yes, but there's still more. It's just um, uh, it's like a starting point, and then you need to uh, uh, adapt to current situation, but also how can you create a more fair start to everyone everyone in your company and, and yes, the people that you impact. Um, what kind of challenges have you seen as a multinational? Because uh, how you're saying you can set up the tone, this is our structure, this is our framework, but when it trickles down, um, where have you seen the most challenges? Uh, maybe can be examples that you've seen both here in Sweden or maybe abroad, if you are also working with, let's say, uh, teams in other countries. What have, seen, wh what have you seen? It's very interesting because regardless if you are a big organization, when I talk to peers in different industries, different sizes of organizations, it is very often the same challenges. <laughs> And that's why we try to connect a lot with those organizations. And we say, like, even like if we are competitors in the market, when it comes to DNI, we are friends. Mm -hmm. And I meet very often, like twice a month, twice a month, no, every two months with Nokia, for example. So uh, just that for that to say that the challenges are quite similar. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is this gender expert, uh, her name is Sharon Peak. Mm -hmm. she's based in the UK, and she says that uh, the three main barriers for women's career progressions are personal, societal, and organizational. So I think when it comes to the personal, and I think we already mentioned a little bit about that, you, th you mentioned, um, 
our biggest struggle right now is to make sure that women apply to our roles. Mm. We have analyzed the full recruitment funnel for the organization to see what are the, you know, the biggest hindering points for women to make it to the organization. The biggest problem is to get a good proportion of women applying to the roles. And you were saying men apply when they see 60%, 70%, I go for it. Women, we tend to go only if we feel 100%. Uh, so that's the first the first piece and how do we actually support that and I say that with a pinch of salt because we have to be very careful about not blaming women but actually fixing mm -hmm. we don't have to fix women we have to fix what are what the systematic mm -hmm. the elements around there then when it comes to organizational perspective um, I think one of the biggest struggles and we also were talking about parental leave is what happens with women when they go on leave mm. um, I think there was this PwC organization that said that three out of five women, when they return uh, back from parental leave, um, they very often go one level down when it mm -hmm. comes to skills, seniority. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, uh, that has an effect, which is also salary. Um, and we also saw now with the uh, most recent uh, Nobel Prize winner in economics, Claudia Goldin, mm -hmm. saying that. Like one of the biggest struggles is like on, on that gender pay gap mm. is when we go on leave. So that how, how we as organizations are actually supporting that. Um, and the third element, what was I going to say? The organizational, the personal, and the societal. You also mentioned, I think, one of the slides, male-dominated organizations. Mm. Um, there was also this research that said that 22% of women in the ICT industry at least 22% of women have experienced uh, gender discrimination. So how do we make sure that, yes, it looks amazing, we make sure that people come, but how do we to actually retain. make okay. sure that the, the industry is right for them? And we see it very often uh, when we are part of one of the biggest events, I'm not going to say names, and we send women, what is the experience? Because if it is the culture out there, it is actually very male dominated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And speaking on that topic of uh, how to create like more inclusive environments and to actually um, this to, uh, to have the sense of belonging, um, El Elin in her company she mentioned that um, maybe you can speak about your company first, uh, but also that within her department they have a 50-50 ratio of uh, representation. So. On that note, um, we would like to understand a little bit how can uh, companies uh, create like an effective environment for women and yes, like recommendations maybe, but also, yeah, like best practices. What has Abshack has been developing? And maybe if you see rather than challenges, what kind of opportunities as well are, yeah, they can be presented there. Yeah, sure. So to mention a little bit about Abshack, we are around 50 employees now and from various nationalities and yeah, various na gender. Uh, at the company at all, we have l about 30% women, so not like 50-50 there, but as you mentioned, within my team, we are 50-50. And that is actually something I haven't really reflected upon before this panel. It's sort of just been mm. normalized. And I think for me at the company, I mean, I started really early, so we were eight employees when I started at AppCheck. And then you have the perk of like, when you're in a new company, to set the culture early. So it's sort of in the root of our company to have an open and inclusive culture. So being open to everyone, talking about like, for example, in the beginning everyone was Swedish, but as soon as we employed our first like in non-Swedish speaking person, since then every policy, everything has been in English, which is really important. We had something that we call flexible holidays, mm. meaning that you can take any holiday during the year and move that day to another day, if so you can celebrate your holidays mm. for your culture, which has been really important. So having that diversity is sort of the backbone as of our, so we just having, I think, really stressing like the culture and the importance of also employing people that mm. share your core values with, we have community and trust, for example, like believing in each other and collaborating with each other has been the core concept with our company. So I would stress for every new company, there are a lot of things you can do even when you're small internally and then sort of slowly as you grow externally like becoming part more of the community mm. but yeah 
And, mm -hmm. and on that note of um, on from small how you uh, it might be easier as well not to have like that direct um, influence on how the the bases are being built mm. um, but is maybe I would like to ask this question because uh, there was when COVID happened and like our whole infrastructure and culture of working changed in terms of more hybrid working remote um, even though uh, within tech is easier to work remotely or it's easier to work from home however uh, globally it affected disproportionately uh, women and in in households and mostly women taking care being the main caregivers and affecting their work so not only going on parental leave but rather setting back because they needed to take the lead of yeah being at home but in sweden it was not very it wasn't the same as like in other countries in terms of um, uh, just not being able to leave your house <laughs> or apartment and so on. However, I would like to understand maybe your perspective on it in terms of have you seen um, have you seen maybe setbacks also in the Swedish context on this in terms uh, of a disproportionate uh, representation as well? Maybe uh, how you're saying like whenever you go on parental leave, you might not advance as 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 like another person that has that is not on parental leave um, yes like just this is like a side note of of your perspective have you seen any here in in sweden particularly after COVID, like maybe setbacks for in terms of gender issues for women setbacks this is for the three of you maybe one of you I just can say, I mean, I think the first element is that if we see, again, data, 70% of the parental leave is taken by women. Mm -hmm. mm. So we still see that even if it is very equal, I think Sweden was of one of the first countries to change from maternity leave to parental leave in 1974. So even if that happens, we still see that men are only taking 30% mm -hmm. of parental so leave in like Sweden. So that can be like a key uh -huh, aspect of So, mm. and I think you were also mentioning, like, how do we make sure that instead of, for example, creating workplaces that allow women to bring their babies, uh, how do we make sure that men are more encouraged to actually take parental mm -hmm. leave? Mm -hmm in equal ways um, as women. And again, then you put the lens on LGBTQI and mm -hmm. then it goes bigger than that. Uh, but one example that I really, I mean, I remember when I moved to Sweden seven years ago, I had a colleague, she went on leave and then when she came back, she was uh, promoted. Mm -hmm. So I think that's when that happens and when you role model that and when men role model that they go for long periods of time for parental leave, I think that's actually when, when you can, you know, set the tone. Mm on what is maybe not expected, but you know, it is okay. We normalize that to happen. Mm. Yes. Have you, have you seen any cases of actually, because as you're mentioning, um, you can set the tone that um, if in the 70s was when Sweden came, uh, became from maternal to parental leave. So this needs to be split six months each, six months each, and, and then the other rest of the months can be sep uh, split among both partners. Um, but how you were mentioned, however, they, um, it's not usually women tend to take most of the months still. Mm. Um, so how is there uh, any example perhaps in, in Ericsson or your company or companies that you at Vinova have seen that maybe are taking an active role on promoting uh, or advocating that more not only women take the, the um, uh, parental leave time, but also men. I don't know, like I, um, in terms of when I say active, is that I wouldn't say perks, but maybe cultural wise within the company. Have you seen that here in Sweden, maybe? Not really. Oh. <laughs> I don't think you can call it a trend, uh, but yes, I've seen examples of companies doing those kind of uh, activities mm -hmm. or taking those kind of stance. And I think it goes back to what you said before uh, in terms of um, making sure that we allocate talents to these companies and working with these um, 
yeah, working with working with making the uh, the workplaces more inclusive and, and open, and with an activity mm. like that, you uh, recruit a diverse amount of talent. So, but I don't think it's a trend. More some examples. Yes, that would, uh -huh. Yeah, I like trend would be the uh, wrong word, but rather. Um, updating or incorporating more at ad ad advancing more or i guess like catering more to the actual needs in society or um uh, but yeah, I, I think there's been quite much uh gender research on like what you've been mm. brought up here that we can see that if uh if a man goes on parental leave and comes back that has a like a good effect on his career because he's seen as someone mm. taking responsibility and being very social competent and a careful person, et cetera, et cetera. But if a, if a mother uh, goes on parental leave, comes back, uh, that can have a negative mm. impact on her career. Exactly. So that kind of research is also very important. And it's uh, from the EU perspective, it's being lifted that we need more of those, uh, that kind of research being made and, uh, and um, uh, being yeah, showed and uh, communicated um, so that is something that is happening, mm -hmm. uh, but then we need to take action on that research as well, mm -hmm. and we're not there yet, I would say. Mm. Yes, and speaking on that, on taking action and, and policies, so this is a, it's going to be like a question for the three of you. So from your sector and your industry and, and yeah, from the company and the place that you, uh, uh, the field you work with, um, how can you incorporate um, these policies, this set of policies? Uh, for example, now with the new regulations for uh, the EU DS e ESGs, mm -hmm. uh, starting in 2024, they're gonna, every company needs to be accountable to incorporate in a sustainability uh, reporting and everything. doesn't matter if it's a small or a large company. So in terms of um, this, set regulations maybe on the EU level now that they're being um, that they're being expected to be uh, incorporated in companies how would that look like for example in a or how has it looked like uh, in Vinova for example or Ericsson or are you uh, in Abshack that is a smaller company how can you incorporate it or how is it like announced or yes just a little bit of how does it look like in practical matters? Oh. <laughs> I think the beauty of policies is that are things that you have to follow. There is no way out of it. And I think that's why it is very important that every time more it is part of what governments and societies have to follow. Um, and we see that, for example, in the US, maybe in some s extreme way, but the reason why we, we see most of the research, most of the even like positions as mine in the US is because locally, legally wise, it is required. It is not anymore an option for you to do that. So I think on, on how to incorporate those, I think once it, it is a policy, then organizations want to be compliant and they will follow. Um, so I think that's like the first step, right? And then the other two elements that I see there is, first of all, top management support. Uh, when it comes from top management of the organization, you are setting again the tone mm -hmm. about like this is what we want to do and this is how we want to do ways. This is this is the way we work. Um, and again, there is less backlash. And then the third element, uh, it is change management with whom I was talking about change management with you. <laughs> uh, I mean, everything that we do when it comes to diversity and inclusion at the end is like, how do we behave? Um, so I think we need to incorporate a lot of like change management and understanding, you know, from a behavioral science perspective, which elements can we input into the processes that we have and not for us to actually change behavior. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and just to add on to that, I think the difference is being a smaller company is that it's sort of you need to have everyone on board kind of directly and to talk about it soon and also to talk about the perks of doing this uh, in a, so in a more opportunistic way. Uh, but then as you're saying, of course, being making sure that everyone follows this and understands this. Um, but yeah, in the scale that works for the company sort of, but really, yeah, focusing on the policy and getting it to the culture again. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm very positive uh, mm -hmm. regarding these new SDGs uh, um, measures from the EU. Um, it will be mandatory to to fill in data on the representation of your company. Uh, I mean, maybe we want it to be a bit more bold mm -hmm. uh, to maybe also, I mean, uh, give out data on like the ownership, uh, for example, of the company. Mm -hmm. But it's always this kind of, uh, so how much pressure should you put on a small company versus a big company when you have like the same kind of uh, measurement being put on, like no matter of like the, um, how big the companies are. Uh, but we don't want to build or finance companies that are not taking this perspective into account and follow up measures, etc. But still, I think it's a, it's a good mm -hmm. thing from the EU, uh, raising the bar with these measurements. Um, but I also want to uh, highlight another one that is happening. Um, it's also a EU uh, framework, an EU policy. Uh, JEPS, Gender Equality Plans, is, it's being something that is um, mandatory for uh, companies and organizations receiving EU funding. And right now, uh, uh, having a, a plan uh, in terms of gender-based violence is not mandatory in that plan. It's a recommendation. But I think in a very mm -hmm. short time of period, we will realize <laughs> from the EU side that it can't be uh, something uh, nice to have. It's something that we need to have in place uh, to make sure that we, we keep women in the field of the ICT sector mm -hmm. and the STEM sector in general. We need to work with um, gender-based violence at the workplace, not as a nice thing to do, but something that we need to do that needs to be mandatory. So hopefully um, we will, you know, uh, in, in our different EU mm -hmm. projects that we're involved, mm -hmm. we can be advocating for being even more bold when um, uh, deciding on these policy mm -hmm. frameworks. Yes. Um, it's so crazy that to think that is, oh, it's a nice to have question there. Just no, but it's, yeah. Um, uh, sometimes uh, how you're saying, like, um, in terms of uh, it's so important to be t timely with the language that we're using or like the things that we are highlighting and, and setting the tone, like the baseline of how we work and who who is part of it, how we include. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, and final question for the three of you. Uh, what do you see the most acute in terms of maybe acute to that needs to be done, uh, maybe from your sector in terms of gender equality um, or to close the gender equality gap, um, more acute and maybe low-hanging low fruit maybe from in Sweden, Sweden perspective as well, that is something that can be incorporated already that it would make like a really big impact, let's say. I think from my perspective, I mean, I've been in this industry now for 11 years and we're sort of, we're still talking about the same questions, but I feel we are coming come, come, kind of a far away uh, now. But I think the main thing that is needed now is that, I mean, we need to get everyone on board. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to get everyone like included and to work on this in order to actually make the change. And I mean, because it's great having these safe spaces where we can talk about the issues and raise our voice. But the question is also, what do I do with these things when like coming out from here, taking that information, as Penila talked a little bit uh, before about including the men and getting mm -hmm. everyone invo involved in order to take all of the knowledge we have and spreading it out there for everyone to work on. I think that's the most important one. I think I must do right now, and also back to what I was saying on how hard it is to get women into, you know, applying to our jobs. I think there is a, a huge job that we all, including organizations, have to do to make sure that more girls get into STEM role, STEM careers, mm -hmm. and as a consequence into ICT roles. Um, we see that that's changing a little bit, uh, but still it is it is quite low, mm -hmm. and what we also see is that although the women, the, no the number of women who is increasing into studying this type of careers, at some point they dropped because of the male-dominated industry, because of some certain cultures, because of X, Y, Z. So how do we make sure that yes, we increase the number of girls or now women studying that type of careers, but that they stay, we retain them? Mm -hmm. um, 
and a low hanging fruit, so that's the must do. And the low hanging fruit, especially for organizations as ours, I think I always go to what we call employee resource groups. Mm -hmm. So grassroots communities of women uh, within the organization. Uh, networking it is quite powerful and, and it, there are also some research about like the importance of having a diverse network within the organization and how that supports your career progression. Um, so employee resource groups is my law hanging for to go. It's something easy to have, no? Like this is a, b a, a database of, yeah, of organizations you can join or so, yes. Oh, I mean, it's a tricky question. Um, but a, a must do, a crucial thing to do from the public sector side, I think it's to really realize that we need to have this uh, system approach mm -hmm. to the societal challenges that we do face. Uh, we can't have um, gender equality politics on one side and innovation politics on the other side. They need to be mm -hmm. uh, integrated. It's like, uh, and be connected. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise we get policies and solutions that do not take um, yeah, this this uh, wide uh, perspectives, mm. like intersectionality perspective into account, and we might develop um, f funding programs that still, uh, you know, benefit one group more than the other, etc. So we need to have this system approach to, to the problems we face and the problems we try to solve. Mm. And maybe the low-hanging fruit connected to that is something that Pranila touched on um, regarding this sector, not always talking about challenges, but actually talking about the possibilities, the possibility of using uh, the ICT industry in making good, mm -hmm. uh, in tech for good, etc. cetera, but because we often see that women, if they start companies, they start companies with an impact focus. Um, being here an impact hub, I mean, like it couldn't be, you know, uh, putting more uh, light on that. Uh, um, so yeah, the low hanging fruit would be to show the possibilities of making good with entering these kind of jobs in this sector. I think that would be uh, something that more women would then feel uh, would be interesting for them to mm. do. Mm. Thank you. I mean, it's very, uh, how you're saying, like more, uh, like summarizing the last part of uh, we need to include everyone in this conversation. Uh, we need to create spaces for retainment, not only inviting, but actually having the right uh, yeah, work environments and tools available and networks available, but also incorporating this intersection of uh, policy making, but also implementation um, and yeah, more systemic. Thank you. I mean this, thank you so much. This